You're listening to the OCD Stories podcast, hosted by me, Stuart Ralph. The OCD Stories is a podcast dedicated to raising awareness and understanding around obsessive compulsive symptoms. I do this through interviewing inspired therapists, psychologists, and people who have experienced OCD. Welcome to the OCD Stories. And welcome to episode 343. And in this one, I welcome back Robert Fox. Rob is a therapist practicing in Woburn, USA, and he specializes in internal family systems therapy. And in this particular episode, we discuss what is internal family systems, or IFS, the idea of parts of us, feeling feelings, the positive intention of our parts, OCD as a signpost to something deeper that needs healing or attention, pushing down feelings in childhood, case examples and examples from his own life, caring for the parts of ourselves, expressing and witnessing emotions and much more really enjoyed my chat with rob uh, i hope you guys do too and thank you to no cd for supporting the podcast no cd offers affordable effective and convenient therapy available in the u.s and outside the u.s to find out more about no cd their therapy plans if they currently take your insurance or to download their free app head over to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the ocd stories or the link will be in the episode description so thank you to Rob for his time and expertise and thank you to you guys as always for listening. I do deeply appreciate it and I hope these episodes continue to educate and inspire you. Without further ado, here is Rob. Welcome back to the show, Rob. Thank you. Good to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you here. So before we get into the, the meat of the podcast, um, I mean, we briefly discussed off air, but I just wanted to check in of how you've been, what you've been up to since we last spoke. Yeah, well, I uh, continue to work from home. Uh, I haven't returned to the office yet. Uh, there are parts of me that really miss that, mm. uh, the connection to people in person. Uh, I do see people outside of work, of course, in person, but there's still restrictions on what I'm comfortable with. You know, restaurants are okay as long as I eat outdoors. Mm. But I miss that contact with my clients face-to-face. Yeah. yeah, I think I think that's because um, the research for most therapies, especially for, for CBT and ERP, show that it's pretty much as effective online as it is in person. I'm sure you found through your work with IFS, it's pretty effective or as effective as it would be in person. But there's just something missing that the studies don't pick up on that when you're in a room with someone, yeah. I'm not saying it makes the therapy more effective, but it's something healing in it, you know? Yeah, presence. Uh, yeah. Maybe, uh, and this is, you know, a topic that uh, people have different feelings about, but touch, mm-hmm. uh, touch can be very effective, a non-sexual, of course, touch, mm-hmm. but maybe just uh, a gentle hand on someone who's given permission on their hand or on their shoulder, um, you know, different rules of thought yeah. about that. But yeah, yeah, it certainly can be transformative. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and that's missing uh, somewhat in uh, virtual. Yeah, uh, but but you know we're also I'm also very grateful for what technology does offer us to yeah. do at the same time. Oh yeah, well, if if this wasn't the internet age and we had the pandemic, we would have we would have stopped therapy for two years. You know, yeah. And what yeah. what implications would that have had for society Absolutely. and individuals? And yeah. Yeah, well, it doesn't bear thinking about. Um, okay, cool. So um, let's, we're going to go into a bit more detail today. So I'll link um, in the show notes to our last um, interview where you talked a bit about your story with OCD and your work with internal family systems therapy. Um, but I guess for those that haven't heard that or ever ever come across IFS, I thought it would be good to for you to briefly introduce IFS and also maybe the key terms that you'll be using today. Sure. So IFS was came about in the late '80s, uh, developed by Dr. Richard Schwartz. Um, he's not the first person to talk about parts of us, uh, but he did uh, discuss uh, or, or he did. Uh, sort of um, bring to the forefront uh, this characteristic of entity within us called self or self energy, Mm. which is very powerful that we all have from birth. Uh, And that parts are things that most of us have, uh, which is uh, a 
what I like about IFS is a non-pathologizing approach. Uh, if a part is extreme, and what we call them protectors, they're just doing a job, and they're they're there to protect us from harm. Uh, and unfortunately, when parts are extreme, they obscure this entity called self, and self is loving, healing, and we have it from within. Mm. So in IFS therapy, the the role of the IFS therapist is to help the client to access that self energy as much as possible. Uh, and parts are doing a, an important job, but sometimes when they're extre- extreme, we have less access to self and that healing from within. So that's a very quick description of IFS and parts. Uh, yeah, and uh, maybe it'd be useful to mention wh- which part is OCD, do you think? Well, that's a good question. Uh, part of me thinks that it's what we call in IFS a category of manager parts, and another part of me thinks it's a firefighter part. I tend to lean towards more of the firefighter part because it comes in uh, when, in my experience, a big exile. Uh, a painful thing called shame comes up. When we feel shame, uh, that's been my experience. Uh, So a firefighter part is a part that comes in to put out the fire, essentially. And uh, OCD has the client be consumed with obsessions or compulsions. And while it may seem that that is not helpful in any way, It's my, uh, actually Richard Schwartz's premise that these firefighter parts are doing a job to protect us, even the OCD parts, from something unbearable, which we call the exile. So, uh, yeah. So, you know, my wife gave me some feedback after the last podcast. I need to relate more about what I'm talking to, to a uh, actual example. So I'm going to actually take that advice. (laughs) So, uh, for myself, uh, the exile was shame, and I also exiled my anger Mm. as a kid. Uh, And I'm going to back up a little bit and say what I mentioned earlier with you before we got on this podcast, that uh, you know as well, that we are mammals wired to connect. It's it's imperative. Mm. It's part of who we are. And uh, as children, we sometimes get the message from our parents that our f- emotions are not always welcome. And if there are parents or grandparents or whoever raises us, sends us in any way this message over time, one time, many times, that our feelings are not welcome, we sometimes exile those feelings. We send them off to Siberia, so to speak, you know. Mm. Uh, And that's what I did with my anger as a kid. And uh, I repressed it because if we're a kid and we want to thrive and survive, if we think that our anger is going to be dangerous or if we object to something, Mm -hmm. then there's a risk that we won't be surviving the family. And I learned that very early with um, what I was going through. Uh, I had brothers who were very sarcastic, and so was one, one or both of my parents. I was very sensitive as a kid, and I used to see that as a, a negative, but now I see it as, as I mentioned last podcast, as a wonderful thing. So anger is one such exile. Uh, and uh, I held that in for years, and not until I discovered IFS as a client as a, and also was trained in IFS as a therapist that I explained last time that I got in touch with this anger, but in a way that was held differently than ever before. Uh, I had a group of peers from my IFS training around me who I felt good with, and also Richard Schwartz was doing a demo with me. And when that anger was witnessed in a new way, like I explained last time, um, it didn't need to be uh, pushed away. 
but it had to be done by people who really know what they're doing, like Richard Schwartz, and I had the self-energy of the peers around me as they listened. And that's what we're looking for in many times in therapy, is to help a client process something very painful, but being held in a new way that wasn't there before when we were kids, and there wasn't somebody there to witness it with self-energy. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, yeah, I like that. Thank you for the example. Um, it, it, you know, what you're saying, it reminds me of um, uh, Sigmund Freud's quote when he said, unexpressed emotions will never die. They are buried alive and will come forth in uglier ways. Yeah. And, th- and that uglier ways could be OCD. Yeah, mm. yeah. Yeah, uh, this other model of therapy, AEDP, we talk about core self. It's you know, mm. when we when we when we realize that who we are at our core is somehow unacceptable to those around us that are supposed to be our family, love. You know, my sensitivity was seen as in some ways a weakness by my family. I would be too too vulnerable, so they. They sent a message that it was almost not welcome, or at least that's what I took in. And so I exiled it, and it took me out of self from that early age. And when we're out of self, we go through life going through life with stronger protectors, and one such protector is OCD. And I originally thought OCD was all bad, that... It didn't have any purpose, but it actually does have a purpose to try to help me with um, memories that are too much to be in touch with. At least at one point I felt that way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's important what you're saying, OCD here. Because obviously it comes up a lot on the podcast and the OCD community about OCD being a bully. And that, and that very much is how I saw it for many years. And now I, is, I see it much more as a kind of a scared part of myself that's just trying to protect me. That's right. um, yeah. That's and, and I'm losing my train of thought, but um, <laughs> it's kind of based on what you're saying. That's what that, um, yeah. Yeah. I've lost the connection, but that's okay. It'll come yeah. back. Yeah. It will, it will come back yeah. eventually. Yeah. I was also um, sort of, learned or taught that it was a bully. In fact, I have seen many kids where they draw pictures and I say, can you draw what the OCD looks like? And they draw this big monster mm. like peering over this little body. And it makes total sense because when, when OCD is strong, I used to call it like a beast, you know, it would take over. And uh, I totally can relate to that and what the kids would uh, draw in the pictures. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, when we learn to uh, get to know what this OCD is about, and we have it witnessed in a in a caring uh, way by a professional, uh, we get to know that it's actually not what we think it is. Typically, yeah, 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 and I, yeah, exactly. And I remember my point. It was just that I pretty much said it all, but it was. Um, it's not necessarily this bully and if people want to have that view of it that's perfectly okay with me if it helps them that's that's all that matters to me as a therapist but my my view and how i try and work with my clients is that it's your brain's scared and it's just trying to help you um it doesn't mean we have to like it but it it doesn't mean we have to see it as this enemy um and yeah it's it's, it's a protector not a not a villain it took me quite a while to figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't overnight. No, uh, no. And I think it's, honest, it's almost maybe easier sometimes to see that once you're kind of doing better, yeah. whereas when you're in the grips of it, it's, yeah, really hard to have that frame of mind. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I, contacted you, I contacted you, as you know, when I had watched this uh, TV series, uh that was here in the United States. It was like one of these emergency room dramas, you know, and it's no longer on the air, but it was called Chicago Med. And this patient came into the um, emergency room with what we would call harm OCD. And he was terrified of his thoughts. And the uh, emergency room psychiatrist uh, proceeded to work with him in sort of an ERP, uh, 
exposure response prevention method. Uh, and it made me think about sort of a topic for this podcast about how IFS sees it uh, and wanted to see if that would be something that you'd be okay with me sharing. Absolutely. And, and just to clarify, so in the t- obviously TV is rarely accurate, but in the TV show, was it in the first meeting with the psychiatrist that he started doing ERP? Uh, not right away. Oh, okay, so it wasn't. Uh, psychiatrist, yeah. that's right, yeah. The yeah. psychiatrist, there was two psychiatrists in the emergency room, and they had a little bit of a difference, on, a dif- difference opinion, on, a different opinion on how to proceed. Okay, fair enough. Um, yeah, so absolutely. And, and do you remember what they said on that show? You shared yeah. with me? Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, the client had a fear of thoughts of wanting to hurt his wife and young daughter, which, you know, can be very alarming to mm-hmm. a person, you know, especially if you have OCD because they tend to stick around those things. Yeah. So, um, the psychiatrist met with the patient uh, and she did a typical exposure to those thoughts uh, and um, you know he he you know in, in, in ERP there's a an habituation so that you overcome this sort of anxiety being you know, mm. very scary uh, and at one point the psychiatrist said um, you know a lot of times these thoughts are nonsense they have no meaning and it caught my attention because. Um, you know, my point here is, I think, as we say in IFS, let's not forget the positive intention of a part. And, and let me pause here because, you know, you and I talked about how we want to uh, make sure that yeah. we're not dismissing uh, people's fears. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's worth, yeah, so I'll add, um, obviously, we're about to talk about maybe the intrusive thoughts as a signpost to something deeper that's potentially completely unrelated to the the intrusive thought or the content, but it's 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 kind of a signpost, a flag. Um, yeah. Not so it's so nothing Rob's going to say is about the content is real. Of course, it's not. You know, just because you 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 worry about being a serial killer. We're not saying in any way you want to be a serial killer. Absolutely That's not. Correct. That's it's absolutely. more just the energy, I guess, behind that thought, the generic feeling, emotion, that signposting to something else. That's yeah. unrelated to the OCD worry, but the intrusion is still, it's a symptom of a of a of maybe an illness within, if we think about physical body. You know, if I suddenly get spots on my arm, big boils or something, that's uh-huh. just a symptom of probably something else that's going on in my system. Yeah. Is that maybe a fair analogy or? Yeah. Um, you use the word illness from within. I <laughs> might be a little bit uh, wary of that word illness. I think uh, I would mm. say the part is extreme. Oh, I was talking uh, about phys- physical illness in my, in uh, my like, nothing to do with mental. No, no. Uh, I never use the word illness. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So, um, for example, in this, um, show he had the this murderous rage right Mm -hmm. but i feel as the show later indicated that he had some resentment that he might have been pushing down a bit on a much lower scale not murderous Mm -hmm. rage but because sometimes that is dismissed either by the client like i shouldn't even have those thoughts and I'll relate back to myself uh, because it helps to have an example. I pushed down my anger for so long because it was forbidden in my family in many ways. I got many messages that it was forbidden. And I also thought as a child that if I had these feelings towards my father that you know, it was never explicitly said in a way, but I took in implicitly as a kid, which naturally do, is that we'll get kicked out of the nest, so to speak, if we express these emotions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think anger has 
positive intentions to speak up for ourselves when we feel hurt. And certainly as a kid, I felt hurt from what I went through. And in this example that I draw from the TV show, he might have had some anger that is on a much milder level. Like, I feel angry that I missed dinner, you know. Or there was a baby who required attention and he, you know, was maybe feeling frustrated, but the OCD takes it to a higher level that scares the bejesus out of the person. And that's what we want to make sure is clear, that, as you said, he, there is no credibility to the thoughts of uh, that he wants to go out and kill people. That's, that's the obsession. It's that he just may have repressed some much milder feelings that his system, one way or another, thinks is forbidden. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it does make, make sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So let me get to my questions. Sure. Yes. Yeah, so I guess just generally, is there anything more you want to say on this idea that intrusions or obsessive thoughts are kind of signaling or signposting to some pain or, even any other examples or client examples? Oh, sure. Well, um, you know, I see in my practice some mothers who um, just gave birth and their child is in the first year of life and they come in with tormented with thoughts that they have. And typically, Mm -hmm. um, these are individuals suffering with OCD, uh, the mothers uh, and fathers, I should say. Uh, and uh, w- one common thought is uh, if the parent, say, is at home 12, 14 hours a day alone with this infant, mm-hmm. uh, they naturally get exhausted. I mean, that's that's a free, really long day. Yeah. And their spouse may be at work. Uh, and again, this can be, I've seen fathers who are at home and mothers are at work and vice versa. And um, one of the intrusive thoughts they have is, you know, something about harm to the baby and it scares the bejesus out of them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as we discover through IFS and parts, um, that person might be pushing down feelings like, I'm just tired, exhausted. Mm-hmm. I haven't showered in days because I can't take the time to shower because there's an infant that's on the bed and if I take my eyes off him or her, mm-hmm. uh well, you know, a baby needs constant attention. And so, a lot of these parents uh, that I see say, oh, I'm not, you know, it's forbidden to, to, to have these thoughts and I'm exhausted. But then it gets much more intense in terms of an intrusion that, that they have something you know, stronger that comes into their thoughts. And when we witness these parts, you know, make sense you're tired, make sure make sense you're exhausted, or make sense that you haven't seen your spouse all day and you've been alone with an infant that is not verbal yet. Uh, this helps these parts that are pushed way down to feel witnessed. And mm-hmm. oftentimes that will help with the intrusions being so strong. Yeah, so let me yeah, check in okay. with you and see what your thoughts are. Yeah, um, it makes sense. Um, yeah, this is where I struggle as an interviewer because IFS, as much as I find it fascinating, it's not one of the therapies I use. So mm-hmm. I, I have to use much more of my brain power <laughs> to, to come up with questions. Um, yeah, okay. But yeah, it kind of makes sense. Um yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's relevant, but like, you know, when I, I, my, my daughter's over two now, but when I had, had her, uh, I started to get thoughts of, you know, um, hurting her and stuff like that when she was a very young baby. And it was very scary for me, even though I knew what was going on. Um, even though you knew what was going on, it's very scary. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, you know, I felt, well, if I didn't, if I wasn't trained in, in OCD or hadn't had OCD historically, like that would have 
set me yeah. off into a big sort of spiral no doubt so i understand how scary it is for parents but yeah i guess my point is if i look at yeah well, the lack of serious lack of sleep over that period the stress the overall anxiety it comes for me at least with like yeah. n- nurturing a child of i'm responsible for this being and um all of this stuff uh there was probably lots that i wasn't yeah. owning it obviously strains the relationship with my wife where I wasn't maybe communicating as well. And so there would have been, I guess I'm saying there would have been lots of stuff going on that I probably wasn't deal dealing with in the best way that may have then manifested in those thoughts. Yeah. Potentially. Yeah. My heart goes out to you because I realize you, as you had told me during our first podcast, you were a new father okay. and, uh, and as you were saying, you were a little bit at a loss of, th- what to say, mm. even though cognitively you said, I get what's happening, uh, even as we speak, mm. uh, and, and when I've had something resonate with me personally, sometimes I, even in sessions, might get a little bit locked up because it's touching on something deeply personal, especially if, you know, so you, you know, what I know about my clients and in general about people with OCD is they're very conscientious people uh i i I always ask people without just assuming or telling them what they are but my experience is that people with ocd are extremely conscientious they tend to be very sensitive and caring warm people who care about people and their feelings and it's just the opposite of what the obsession or compulsion is telling them and it scares them because It's the extreme opposite, the obsession or compulsion. Like, if they get an intrusive thought of harm to someone, it is very alarming because it goes against what they know about themselves, that they are. It's the very, it's it's the opposite of what they want and feel. Uh, They actually don't want those thoughts at all. Mm. And it doesn't really represent who they truly are at their core you know yeah. there's this term ego syntonic ego dystonic right so something that's ego syntonic is something that uh, goes along with what our values are and when an intrusion or compulsion comes in well more of an intrusion of a thought uh it's ego dystonic because it's like that's not how i feel at all And my own example is um, I had a type of OCD called relationship OCD. And so my worst nightmare would be that I'd do something painful to my partner in terms of either having a thought about her or an action. And it's really the opposite of who I am. Who Rob really is at his core is he cares deeply about people's feelings. And I imagine for you the same, you know. I have to ask you, I can't assume, but knowing you, I could see when we met how much you are deeply in love with being a dad. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. It's hard. <laughs> it's, it's hard. Great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I think, but yeah, that was maybe, yeah, worth sharing, especially it kind of links back to the disclaimer of obviously I never wanted to hurt my child. Absolutely. But it was, it was, at the time, yeah, acknowledging what else is going on, you know, that yeah. in in my life, it, it, and that was going. I guess that's a question. So with the intrusions, it, I was, this is my terminology, but like signaling towards something deeper. Um, so the example I shared was, I feel a lot of that was very much going on in the here and now for me. You know, like life stress. Yeah. Is it always like that, or sometimes is it signposting a historical pain? Ah, okay. So, like, if a person's symptoms intensify at a certain point, if the, if I understand you correctly, is it likely from something in the here and now that's happening around them, or could it be something in the past? Yeah, I think, um, so, are you familiar with uh, Dr. David Burns? This is what? Um, David Burns, David Burns. Uh, refresher for me. He's a he's a CBT guy, but he ah, um he's been on the podcast. Re- but he, he write the book uh, about depression. 
Yeah, I think so. Um, what's it called? Uh, I can't remember. Anyway, yeah, it's a really well-known book. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah fe- feeling good. That's it. That's yeah. It. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and obviously, he, he's very CBT. He created Team CBT, as he calls it. But there's a, a very almost like psychodynamic intervention within that called um, ah, what's it called? Anyway, he he basically uh, oh the hidden emotion model. Uh, okay. Yes, it's kind of similar to this, but less less intricate. But he he gets people to like he tells them to like look for their diary, and if you suddenly had a flare up of OCD, look for your diary and and see if any names or things trigger like an intense feeling for you. If they do, there's probably a conversation that you need to have with that person. I'm probably butchering it, but it's something along those lines. And he's found with a, a certain percentage of his clients that when they find that person, have that conversation, the one that they're avoiding, mm. their symptoms reduce considerably. Okay. So that for that, that hidden emotion model, it's very much about the here and now. Like something's going on in the here and now that the person's not dealing with. Yeah. Whereas a lot of IFS, I guess, and, and in your examples are like, historical traumas if, if it's fair to say uh, i think it's a combination of both to, yeah. to okay. tell you the truth i think there's when my ocd flares up and you know while much of my ocd as i mentioned last time has gotten better it's still around at times mm. and if i have a flare up which happens from time to time uh it's usually some stressor in the present but it brings me back to something in the past okay. that this current stressor is reminding me of. Mm-hmm. You know, a feeling of uh, I don't have control or a sense of I feel some shame coming up. Uh, so it might drag me back. So I, th- I, I tend to think it's both. I think that without something in the present that's stirring things up, uh, it wouldn't, I wouldn't say it wouldn't come up at all, but it, it's not yeah. as likely to come up. Uh, you know, just in the past um, six months, I got even a little bit triggered myself. You know, mm. um, I felt certain demands on me from certain people. And when I felt like I'm getting hit from all sides, so to speak, uh, I got activated and it took me back to a feeling from the past. Mm. Uh, fortunately, uh, I, I, I sat with it and noticed my parts and what's happening. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, yeah, okay. So, 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 yeah, it's kind of a stressor in the present. Yeah. It's kind of linking back to something deeper, maybe historical within us. But the, the stressor in the present is the thing that's reigniting it almost. Well, yeah. And I can give you specifics if it yeah. helps. Uh, so... Uh, if I'm feeling like I'm not meeting the needs of of certain people in my life that are important to me, mm-hmm. uh, and it happens to be a lot at once, um, then it takes me back to a place earlier where uh, I feel deficient in, in meeting those needs. Um... And then there's another part inside of me that says, well, uh, my boundaries aren't being respected. And so when I try to put those boundaries more in place, because, you know, every so often we need to remember, oh, yeah, I've got to, you know, in IFS we call them protectors or walls up in some ways to make sure that these boundaries aren't violated. Uh, Sometimes I get pushback from those people. And... uh, and it doesn't feel so great because I am trying to take care of me and mm-hmm. find that balance of caring for me so I can care for others. And, of course, a lot of people identify with the, uh, you know, that analogy if you're on an airplane, you got to put the mask on you first before you put it on others. And sometimes if I start to feel like I'm going under because I'm giving out more than giving taking in, and taking in can also involve self-care, uh, then there's that feeling if there's an imbalance of a little bit of drowning. So what helped me get back on track was some help from a couple people like my own therapist to remind me of, hey, those boundaries are important. 
Uh, don't forget to take care of you. I have a sibling who reminded me of that. I'm so grateful for. And, you know, that's a shift where I can take back, hey, oh yeah, i got to balance this ship out. If I get back into that younger part that was trying to take care of somebody more than, than myself, then I'm getting into some trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I can relate to that in the sense of about end of November last year, uh, I suddenly get um, getting very anxious in my therapy sessions, i.e. where I'm the therapist. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, it, and the symptoms was at first I was like, I, I just felt like I was going to pass out. I was going to faint. And of course I wasn't. It was It was the beginning of a panic attack. But in my head for about three weeks, I was like, I'm, I'm going to faint. I'm going to faint. And then I was terrified of, of actually it started with a fear of getting migraines in session. So I started taking paracetamol when I shouldn't have been taking paracetamol. Um, <laughs> and that was obviously a compulsion to like lower my anxiety. And then it was like, I'm going to faint. I'm going to pass out. And about three weeks in, I'm like, hang on a minute. This, this isn't a physical thing. This is anxiety. Uh, and then, but that didn't help acknowledging that I st- and then my anxiety sometimes in session was getting up to like a nine out of ten to the point where I'm gripping my chair thinking I'm going to run out any second I'm this anxious I'm, I'm going to run out uh, and it was horrible I started to like hate going to work because um the anxiety I didn't want to feel that way and and you know for me being a therapist is one of the things I value most on this planet you know I, I love my job um but when I was anxious, it, it took all of that away. Um, and I guess that comes back to OCD kind of when people say it like latches onto the things you care about, you know, for me. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 yeah, anyway, it was like I'm I'm doing much better now, but it took me like five, six months of slowly reducing my compulsions again, doing some acts, living by my values, bringing in compassion. Um right. but but yeah, I know what triggered it. Um but I think, yeah, it links back to something in me of just not being good enough. Yeah, Stuart, I'm so glad you were willing to be willing to share that because I just had that happen about three weeks ago. Okay. A very similar, a very similar mm. experience. I was go, go, go. I wasn't having that balance of self care. Mm. Yeah. And I was in a session. And I felt like I was running out of options to tell somebody about what they could do to help themselves. Mm. And all of a sudden, I started having that similar feeling. Mm. So, see, we were connected on other sides of the pond. And uh, so, um, what actually helped me was I was saying to her, to her, the client, I said, how is your self-care? Yet... There was a part of me being somewhat hypocritical because I wasn't doing that for myself. I was yeah. going, going, going. And at one point I said, Can, would you be willing to try something? And she said, okay. So I had her put her hand on her heart. Mm-hmm. And I put mine on mine, uh, my heart at the same time. Now, what I didn't realize was not only was that helpful from her because she had this terrible anxiety in her stomach, but when I placed my hand on my heart, it it, it was unbelievable. I actually my whole system calmed down that was feeling like I'm not providing, I'm not providing, I'm not providing. And because I was kind of feeling like I was running out of things to tell her, like I was like, Oh, I'm not doing enough that, you know, some of my old parts. Mm -hmm. And then my system calmed down. And then because my system calmed down, I could be more present with her, which is a very uh, important point of IFS is that when Mm -hmm. we care for our own parts, then we can be there more present with our clients. And what was going down a, a rabbit hole for me, you know, it was like, oh, here it is again. I'm getting all locked up inside. My body felt like I was locking up. Maybe you can relate. And then I was like, oh, shit, you know, this is going to be a disaster, blah, blah, blah. And then with that whole simple gesture, like our systems calmed down. And, and then I saw her face, and then she saw my face. And then the next session, when I was with her, I said, when it was appropriate, I said, you know, what happened inside me? Because I don't want to take over, of course, it's her session. She goes, no, I welcome hearing. She says, I started to lock up, and I realized I wasn't caring for myself. 
And she's like, oh, that's so interesting. And we had just this really touching moment, you know, kind of like what you and I are having right now, because I think we're relating in some way. I mean, we both have probably a little bit different, but we're on the same common ground, I think. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I think think it's... Yeah, and I also wanted to share it, because I think it, it... it's fairly common for therapists to maybe feel that overwhelm in session. And, and I don't think it's talked about enough, probably because of shame of I'm a therapist. I shouldn't be experiencing this in session. That's right. And yeah. part of my reason I was experiencing it was in the outside of the session. Hmm. Not only was I not being as good with self care, I was feeling some walls c- coming in of pressure from some of those people in my outside life and in, in the boundaries, and it felt like the walls were closing in, you know, literally. <laughs> and, uh, well, not literally, but at least in my body. Mm. I couldn't breathe, and then all of a sudden I s- was able to get back online and say, with this simple gesture of a hand, which I didn't even realize it was going to help be helpful to me, I was thinking of her, which is part of my problem. <laughs> I'm always thinking of the other, mm. you know. Well, certainly in a session, that is what it's supposed to be about. But yeah, yeah. but I also need to be there for me. If that makes exactly. Sense. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, thank so you for is, sharing. Yeah, thank you too, because um, you're right. You bring up an important topic. Due to shame, uh, a therapist, you know, it, it, it's historically kind of almost like taboo, like mm-hmm. what's going on inside. That is one of the beautiful things about IFS is that shorts pointed out that if we are in self, then it is catchy and it exudes, comes out of almost like our pores and clients pick it up. And we can't be there in self if we haven't cared for ourselves. It's pretty hard. Yeah. And I have to remember that because, you know, from a young age I was in the service of caring for someone else in a way. Mm, good point yeah yeah Yeah, good good example as well for this topic so how can we get to know the deeper message or the part or get curious towards its positive intent anything you want to say on that yeah well our, our our psyche naturally protects about from going there you know we have these protectors or some people call them defenses, from going to these deep, painful things. And so, in the IFS model, we gently work with the parts that are not allowing us to go to these deep, deep, painful things. Mm. Uh, Because we're afraid we're going to get overwhelmed if we go there. And many times in our younger, formative years, we were. So, naturally, we don't want to go there. So IFS is a model that helps gently, ever so gently, to get the permission of the protectors to go to these deep, deeper painful things. Mm. Uh, I just went to a, a little bit of a different topic, but related is psychedelic conference. Okay. Yeah. And psychedelics are another way that protectors mm. are able to allow access to the painful thing without kickback, you know, or pushback from our parts. Uh, not to go off on another whole topic, but that, oh, yeah. that also has shown us that these protectors that are actually trying to do a job sometimes um, are doing such a good job to protect us that they don't allow the healing. Yeah. And in IFS, we deeply feel we need to respect these protectors be- before we ever go forward. Mm. So your question is a good one. How do we go there um, with a lot of permission, <laughs> you know, respectful permission from these parts that protect? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I guess what comes to my mind there is, respecting the protectors of like, or in this case, respecting the OCD, which, which I know for many of my listeners listening is like, especially if they, they believe the whole, it's the bully or that's how they see it. It's really hard to kind of respect a bully. Res- respect a bully. Absolutely. 
Um, but I guess for me, remembering that OCD is, is, a, is, a, is a part of my brain and and I, I've, I've also viewed it as like a, a scared child, you know, the OCD is a scared child. And when I look at it from that, I, I can have more respect for it, but not maybe not in respect is the right word for me, but like understanding and compassion. And then I can start to give that part of me, that OCD part of my brain, the respect, uh, yeah, respect, compassion, understanding. And then it makes it easier for me to not react to it as much or to see it as this small thing as opposed to this big monster that's going to eat me alive. Um, yeah. Yeah, as opposed to like try to just kill it off. Right. So sometimes, in, a lot of times in IFS, we say, can you let that part know that you get it? And when the part feels heard and understood by ourself, mm. then it, it's like, ah, oh, someone's listening. Someone inside is listening. You know, the part, we call it a self-to-part relationship. So when the part feels understood uh, and is able to say, hey, someone heard me in there. Yeah, self heard it. Yeah. The yeah. part sometimes relaxes because it says, Oh, thank God, all this work I've been doing is being noticed. Yeah. And so, it is a beautiful thing when you sort of say, can you let that part know that you get what it's trying to do? And you see this sort of look on people's faces where they're like, yeah, yeah, I see what that's trying to do. Mm -hmm. I love that question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, hmm. Mm. yeah i think uh, that kind of brings me into like acceptance commitment therapy of like naming no no yeah noticing and naming um of yeah can you notice that part and and name what it's trying to achieve and by doing that you take away a lot of the power that it's uh -huh. not this big thing it's you've named it you've you've categorized it it's more manageable um in yeah. ifs it's kind of uh we, we, we really mean this when we say this, not just to trick it. We say mm. we're not looking to get rid of that part. And truly, it's, 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 it's absolutely true because these parts are doing something, mm. you know, with positive intent. They're always positive intent. Richard Schwartz's latest book is No Bad Parts. Uh, it's a really great book. Uh, no Bad Parts, that OCD parts even though they, when they're extreme, can cause us torment and mm -hmm. suffering, uh, when these parts go into their more moderate, preferred state, then we can go through our lives much with less pain. Yeah. But if we tell the part we're trying to get rid of it, uh, it often feels like you don't understand what I'm here for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like with the bully thing, it's, 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 it's a... That concept of instead of bullying back the bully, we just get to listen to the bully and what it's trying to say, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, I know it's a counterintuitive, but it really, you find out that the bully was kind of bullied in a way. Yeah. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, very true. Um, so I make sure, yeah, well, um, I know we've discussed this a lot, I think, but I, I think I want to uh, explicitly ask it. Um, the, the importance of expressing and witnessing emotions. Mm. Yeah, good topic. Um, in IFS, part of the unburdening process is just witnessing what a part of us has done to try to help us. Mm. So the unburdening, some people say, or think that IFS is when, you know, you release this burden and that's the real unburdening. Well, actually in IFS, the whole process that we don't rush of just witnessing what this part has done mm. or how it's impacted us. So like when I had, I'll relate it back to an example, when, when I would go on vacations with my family, my father would not allow me to have access to my mom where I wanted some, some caring about my fears and anxiety. He was too worried that 
I would uh, burden her too much with those those feelings. So um, part of the witnessing was my therapist really getting to know over time uh, how much I had to push down and not share and feel isolated from my mother and what I really wanted to, when I wanted to get comfort. So that was witnessed by my therapist. And if, if the therapist were to jump right to something much deeper, it, it would bypass that witnessing, which having my feelings understood clearly, not only by the therapist, but more importantly by my own self, then, then that would be missing an important piece of the process. So, yeah, having feelings witnessed are so important. Yeah, and if we think it, it, in that early moment for you, it, nothing got witnessed, you know, or you, you weren't able to express what was going on for you in, in childhood. So mm-hmm. the therapist starting off with witnessing that for you is is righting a wrong almost, you know, and going back. It was, and, yeah, thank you. That's mm-hmm. Thanks for naming that. It's like a breath of fresh air. Mm. You know, I, I've been to so many therapists where they'd say, this thought, this issue is just an obsession and it really has no purpose. And I remember my first IFS therapist who said, let's get to know this. And I had parts that say, yeah, well, this is silly. I shouldn't go into this. Mm. You know, because I was so used to being labeled on a blackboard as obsessive and having no meaning. And this was like a breath of fresh air when the person said, let's just get to know these feelings. And if there's any parts of you that feel shame about, you know, you shouldn't be talking about this, which I've been kind of mm. groomed to feel, you know, yeah, it was like, oh, wow, it's like the father or mother I really wish I had who mm. just said, I'm here to listen. Yeah. And it was like, oh, my God. And also my body relaxed and my parts relaxed because... I didn't have to say, but wait a minute, there's something important here that's painful. Mm. Please let me say it instead of being cut off, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's great to hear. Yeah, Um, yeah, awesome. Uh, So that that was all my questions. Is there anything else you want to say on this topic before I ask a couple different ones? I think that feels pretty complete. What do you... What thoughts or questions do you have? So, so, um, last time I asked you advice for your 20 year old self, Mm. do you remember that? And then, um, actually, I think I do. It's coming back. Yeah. And then, so this time I want to change the age. So you can pick up the phone and call the seven year old Rob. What do you tell him? I tell the seven-year-old, I know he feels very alone and scared. And he feels very nervous about, for me, going away on vacations was very scary because that's when my dad would be in the car and he would cut off communication between me and my mother. And I'd tell him that I'm in the back seat with him. Uh, the 58-year-old Rob, who's right here today, is in the back seat with that seven-year-old. And that I love him. And that his sensitivity is a wonderful thing not to be ashamed of. And I'd reach over and give him a hug and say, I'm here for him. I'm here for you. You may feel cut off from mom and dad, which I understand as a kid that's extremely important to have that connection and that unconditional positive regard. But I'm here for you. And I'm going to watch out for you. And whatever feelings you have, scared, joyful, anything in between, I, I'm, I'm here to hear them and let you know that you're okay as you are, and that I'll always be here for you through difficult times, happy times. And you can just turn to me, and I'll hold those feelings for you. And not just hold them, but know that 
that they're important to me. And you can always turn to me. Yeah. Yeah, what a great message. Yeah, that would have been good to do right at the beginning. <laughs> 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 not that it was not good at the end, but I realized mm. there was still parts of me from that last mm. thing that we shared yeah. that were a little bit still blended. Mm. And uh, I really appreciate you, Stuart, for leading me through that very brief exercise yet very important one because uh mm. you know with what's going on with covid and yeah. as i said at the beginning i'm still missing some of that connection so thanks for taking me there oh, my, my pleasure thank you for being vulnerable um and yeah I, I i guess the thing that came to my mind as you shared that with that younger you of like so many people with ocd arguably most of them are highly sensitive people hsps yeah. yeah and and that's probably why we manifested ocd and not some other diagnosable thing you know um yeah because that is such a character trait of people with ocd they're typically very very nice yeah to their, I, to their detriment yeah, yeah yeah sometimes nice people don't always get yeah, the short end of the stick, but if we speak exactly. up for ourselves, <laughs> yeah, they're there, then it's the superpower because you get yeah, the best, that's, best of both. That's, that's right, that's right. Mm. Yeah, okay. So, oh. you, you, you've got a billboard uh, again. You've had this one before. Uh, what oh, yeah. do you want written on it this time? Ah, right, let's see. It sounds, it would say, it sounds selfish, but in order to be there for others, we got to take care of ourselves first. Mm. And for OCD, guilt is often a big piece of it. Yeah. But uh, we have to really care for ourselves first so that we can be there for others. Mm. And I have to remind myself that sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, it's easy to forget, isn't it? It's very easy to forget. Yeah. At least for me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, true. I, Yeah. So are you going to say? Uh, well, that's for another talk. I call it the FOMO, fear of missing FOMO. out. <laughs> yeah. And there's still a part that needs some healing around FOMO for me. Okay. Uh, I think part of my give, give, give is because there's FOMO pain, mm. and that's another layer that I wish to explore perhaps in another podcast. Okay, yeah. yeah. And uh, I came to realize that part of my most recent, uh, as I, we were sharing, a um, little bit of lockup in the body as I was working was because there's some FOMO there that needs healing. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. All right. well, awareness is the first step. That's right. That's uh, right. Yeah. You got it. So, uh, lastly, is there anything else you wish you could have said or shared today? Uh, thank you for asking. Uh, I, I found it touching, and I, I do think I mentioned this, but just to reiterate it again, I think it's touching mm. that you and I were able to connect about a similar experience in some ways. Mm. And I do believe my way, I'll speak for myself, but anybody else can join me in their thoughts as well if they like, including you. I think my way out of uh, OCD in a way is vulnerability and and sharing vulnerability because uh, it is risky, but it's kind of like a form of ERP. <laughs> you know, yeah. Dick Schwartz uh, would say, if you don't fear the part, it can't hurt you. So I feared being vulnerable and shame, being looked at as bad. And sometimes when I share, 
there's those parts that come up, but overall I found that it's a good path, that we don't fear it because we say, hey, here I am, here's this thing I fear. I'm doing it here with you in front of an audience, yeah. and nothing terrible seems to really occur. It is a form of ERP, so we're back to yeah, it. Is. yeah. You know? Yeah. Which is ironic. Yeah. So I want to give that credit to the ERP yeah. folks. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. We can work together. Yeah. All, all roads lead to Rome. Yeah. They all, yeah. yeah. They all over intersect somewhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, thank you for that addition. And, and again, thank you for your time and, and your knowledge. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Stuart. It's great to see you. Yeah. Take good care. Thank you for listening to this week's podcast. If you enjoy the OCD Stories podcast and would like to support us with a one-time tip slash donation, please go to theocdstories.com forward slash support. All tips, no matter how large or small, are greatly appreciated. Please subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to the podcast. And thank you to NoCD for supporting our work. If you want to find out more about NoCD, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or click the link in the episode description. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. And until we speak, take care.